Thank you, praise team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, this, uh, this morning I, I got here about 7 o'clock, and, and uh, Stephen Headley, our AV guy, was up on ladders trying to get our electrical back up, you know. We'd had some things go down. We only had one screen. I wasn't even sure that was going to last, and, you know, and, and it, live stream isn't working right now. Um, and so I know he's bummed out about that um, because we have like over 100 people that watch us on live stream uh, every, every Sunday. But I just want us to give thanks to Stephen. So uh, here at 5 in the morning to do that. 5 in the morning. Anyway. Well, it's great to have you here. This, of course, is, uh, is our summer series called the Summer Games. And uh, week one, we talked about the Olympic flame. Just in quick review and how that flame that was passed from torch to torch, from person to person, it was all about the flame. It was all about that light and all the people on, who were on the path of that light, how that impacted their lives. And, and then we compared that light to the light of Christ that you and I are called to pass on from torch to torch, from life to life, to the people that we work with, as I prayed about, the people in our communities, the people in our families, and to let them know about Jesus Christ. Well, last week we talked about the intensive training it took to be an Olympian and a pastor. Come on now, that was funny. <laughs> if you haven't seen that, you've got to go online. If you remember when I did my training and I came up over the hill, yeah, that's the retention bond. I would have to swim it now. But uh, anyway, we talked about the training and how important it is for Olympians. I mean, they take up to eight years just to make it to the Olympic Games. But the same is true for us. We have got to train to have spiritual discipline in our lives. The Apostle Paul said, is it beat your body into submission. It's all about submission. So that you don't disqualify for the prize. And that is the golden crown in heaven. Well, this is week three. And the title of this message is Overcoming Hurdles. Now, I don't know how much you all know about, about hurdles. I had to do some research myself this, this week. But uh, that is not an easy race. How many of you are hurdlers? Let me hurdles. We got a couple that are here. Is that right? Harry and Pete, you guys were hurdlers? My goodness, things have changed. All right. <laughs> well, Lucas, you're, you're a hurdler. Seriously, what do you do? The 100 meters? Yeah? 110 and the 300. All right, all right. Well, then you can correct me if I'm wrong on some of this stuff, but um, all, all I know is, 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 is it is very simply a matter of as running and jumping, running as fast as you can and jumping over things that are in your way. I mean, that's what it's all about, and hoping, and hoping you can, right? And hoping you can. So, and there's a rhythm to it, isn't there? There's a one, two, three jump, one, two, three jump, ten times, ten hurdles. And the, and the height of the hurdles is different. Did you know that? It varies from as low as 27 inches, I think, in youth racing, to as high as 42 inches. That is high. 42 inches, just sprinting over that. Is that how high you run? Is, do you do the high hurdles like that? Yeah, they might be a little lower than that in the uh, uh, high school. But, uh, but in the Olympics, for the short races, you have the highest, the 42 inches for the men. And uh, then for the longer races, you have the lower ones. It's all based on gender and age and all that kind of stuff, too. But, uh, so we have a few of you, of you who have run hurdles. I've got to tell you, I, I did, too, um, one time. One time. I was, on the, I was on my freshman track team in, in high school. And, uh, and I, I, I was always pretty fast. You know, I thought, well, I'm going to do the sprints. Well, I found out I wasn't so fast. So, but I was determined to do something, and so I did the mile. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it. I did okay. I mean, I'm, I, I made our school record. I broke our school record. It was, it was under five minutes. Uh, look, I know it's under three now, I think. But anyway, but at the time, yeah, I, I finished in four, four minutes, 57 seconds, and I threw up. And that's why I did not stay in track and field. But I've always loved it. I've always loved watching it. I just get such a kick out of the variety of all the different um, uh, sporting events there are. <laughs> She's not crying, so she can stay. All right, this is good. Um, and, uh, but I, and, and, and I had a friend, though, who in high school, he was a year older than I was, he was really good at the hurdles. And uh, he did the, it was 100 yards in those days, so shorter than 100 meters. But he was posted in 13-something seconds in those. I ended up going to state. I don't remember if he placed or not, but he was pretty good. Now, if you've been watching the Olympics, you saw that our U.S. women uh, swept the hurdle races in the Olympics the first time ever. That was pretty cool. Our men did well, too. But I've got to tell you, I'm always amazed whenever I watch the races, and I, even early this morning, I'll admit, I was, I was watching some of them, you know, just to get ready for the sermon here. And um, I'm always amazed at how many hurdles get hit, you know, but you ever hit a hurdle? Once or twice, 
once or twice. Harry, how about you? You ever hit a hurdle? Yeah, okay, okay. Well, it, it, it's kind of it's interesting because obviously um, if you hit a hurdle, it's going to slow you down, but you can still hit a lot of hurdles and run a great race, all right? You really can. In fact, in the 1996 Olympics, this is a good one to remember here, um, I, it was in Atlanta, Georgia, and Alan Johnson was our number one hurdler. In the 110 meters, he hit every no, he had every one but one of the ten hurdles, knocked eight of them down, and broke the Olympic record. Yeah, 12.95 seconds. Yeah, it just, it was, it was crazy. And um, I, I was amazed he didn't fall. And when I was doing my research on this, I, I found out that that's the biggest fear of hurdlers, is hitting a hurdle and, and falling. Um, not only because of getting hurt, but it's just going to be humiliating to lay there on the track when everybody else is going. And... Um, I also learned that the one thing that will happen at least once in the career of every serious hurdler is you will fall. So count on it. <laughs> you will hit one and you will fall. Now, there's a lot of different reasons why you might. You might hit one and fall because you're tired, you're fatigued, all right, physically and then mentally. It's usually a mental mistake. Um, you might fall because you lost focus. Because sometimes what happens is in a race like that, your focus is on the competition. Or, or the end line, right? That's what you're focusing on, and you're forgetting about the hurdles. You've got you to focus on the hurdles. You've got to get over the hurdle to get to the end. In fact, one of the most famous um, uh, um, uh, incidents like this was Gail Devers in 1992 Olympics. She was winning the whole thing, had her focus on the prize, and on the competition that she was barely beaten, lost her focus on the hurdles, tripped over the last hurdle that far from winning the gold. From winning the gold. That's pretty crazy. Another thing that might happen is what's called the accumulation of blows. If you hit enough hurdles, you can finally just, you know, blow after blow after blow, you finally just get tired and you just, you just go down. And that can be a devastating experience, I think, in any sport, but especially if you're a hurdler. I mean, you're not supposed to go down. The accumulation of just sitting on a track all alone while everything is going by you. I, and, and I read an article, they said that can cause some very, very serious uh, emotional and attitudinal um, issues with you, almost like PTSD, because it's like it, 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 can, it can cause you to have a fear, fear of stepping out, and, and in life itself, fear of stepping out, taking risks, because running hurdles is a risk, you know. It can cause doubt, of course, doubt that you've been qualified to do what you what you thought you did really well. And falling in a in a hurdles race isn't always a matter of technique, um, either. Uh, not always. Um, sometimes something or someone from an outside lane can cause the problem, all right, if they fall or if they knock the hurdle over into your lane. So that can happen as, as well. And sometimes it's just a matter of confidence. You stop believing in yourself. You stop believing you can do it. But the reality is all hurdlers that sometime in their life are going to hit a hurdle and fall down, every one of them. But it's the good ones who get back up and finish the race. Some of you might have seen this guy who was pretty proud of himself, this Haitian runner in the Olympics. He was like doing the Usain Bolt thing, showing off for the cameras before the 110 meter hurdles. Yeah, then he's like, you know, kind of cocky and he's getting ready to go. The gun goes off. He wipes out on the first hurdle, does a somersault. They say it's like the, the Olympics most uh, embarrassing moment for someone. But he finished the race. He did finish it. On May 20th this year, I read this, an Idaho state hurdler ruptured her Achilles tendon at the beginning of the 400-meter hurdle finals and fell down. But she picked herself up and finished the race. That says a lot. Now, my point here is, with starting with all this stuff about hurdlers, is like, whether you are a hurdler or not, we all hit hurdles in life. We all have things that come up that are in our way. And sometimes we can get over them, and sometimes we can't. And they're going to knock us down. Think about the things that can get in the way like that. The death of someone you love, a job issue, debt, disease, divorce, drugs. And that list goes on and on and on. Now, now, now sometimes it's something from outside your lane. It's just life itself, you know, that gets thrown at you. And sometimes it's just fatigue. You're just tired. You've been running this race for some time and you finally just get tired. I know my dad was tired at the end of his life. And sometimes it's lack of focus. We let the world take our focus off of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, we get hit. 
And sometimes it's just an accumulation of blows. It's just one thing after another. You ever feel that way? You just keep getting hit again and again and again and again. And you know what? That's, that's like boxing. I mean, I, I like watching boxing. And when you watch boxing, I mean, sometimes you go, yeah, the guy takes somebody out with one punch. That happens frequently, right? But it's not always a, a, a rock-solid hard punch that knocks someone out. It could be a series of, of good blows, round after round after round, until finally he's just so tired, it's not even a good shot, but you go down. That happens. Well, <clears throat> I want to share with you my thoughts on that. Because it goes back to the question. Whatever it is that causes you to hit a hurdle in your life that takes you out, the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to get back up and finish the race? Because that's what God wants. And that's why He put us here. And He tells us in His Word that we are going to have hurdles in our life. We're going to have all kinds of things in our life that are going to get in the way. And they're going to try and take us out. And He either allows or causes those things to happen in our life. Why? To strengthen us. To discipline us. To ensure that we will finish the race and finish it well. And finish it strong. And it's because of Jesus we can count on doing so. Because the biggest hurdle we have in this life is the hurdle of sin. And we did not go to hell because of sin. But unbelief. Jesus took care of the sin. And we say, thank you, Jesus. I have a, a story of someone I want to share with you. This is a young man who I heard was, is here today, somewhere. Put up your hand, Matt, would you? Just, there you are, over there hiding, okay. Glad you can make it. Matt's a young man, 22 years old. I just met him this last week. 22 years old. And um, I met him because Chris Jack met him. Chris Jack met him, I think, in a parking lot somewhere. They were going out. And, um, and Chris is walking behind him. And he was kind of wondering about the, the young man walking ahead of him. You know, Chris is into situational awareness, right? And so, uh, and, and he really got a little worried when he heard the guy mumbling to himself. He thought, uh-oh. This guy's crazy. And then he recognized what he was saying. He was quoting scripture. He was quoting scripture, verse after verse after verse, chapter after chapter. And so Chris called out to him, still not sure who he was. He said, hey man, what's up? And the guy turns around, Matt turns around, and starts sharing with him. He says, can I share with you what God has to say for you and his word? And he starts sharing Verse after verse with Chris. With Chris, of all people, right? I mean, if you know Chris, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a very ironic. And then when they started to depart, that same young man, Matt, he says, can I pray with you? Moved by the Spirit. That's pretty cool. Well, let me tell you something about this young man, and then I'm going to show you a video of him so he can speak for himself. Matt's had a tough life. Do you know what he does for a living? He's a professional MMA fighter, mixed martial arts. As an amateur, he went undefeated. He's got all kinds of titles in jiu-jitsu, Brazilian stuff. I don't know what the, all the names are, but he can tell you if you're interested. And then he became pro. And um, I heard he was ranked 60th in the world right now. Matt Moody, you can look him up, Google him. And his record is 5-2. and two. And the reason it's 5-2, and two, which is outstanding for a professional MMA fighter, by the way, but he has two losses because he's got a hurdle in his life that takes him down every once in a while. It's drugs. He's got an addiction. He now has two weeks clean and he's training for another fight. And uh, it's um, supposed to be at the Cedar Park Center. And it's, uh, it's quite a big deal um, because that could take him to where he wants to go. But I'm going to let him tell you the rest of his story. Let's, let's play his video. Everybody get ready because here we go. Got the flame that's taking over the globe. Yeah, burning through the chains that hold. No matter what your past is, leave it in the ashes. Gonna light it up like this bro. Gonna set it up and watch it. Well, we are here with, uh, with my good buddy, Matt Mooney. 
And uh, Matt, I just got to meet you relatively recently, and uh, your story is just really incredible, man. Tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, what you do for a living. My name is Matthew Moon, 22 years old, from Byron, Texas. I'm a pro fighter and get beat up for a living. How'd you get into how'd you get into fighting? A lot of my family members, uh, for three generations of uh, martial arts. My dad, my grandpa was fighting competing. My dad fought and competed. And then got me and my brother into it when we were young. We started competing real young. I think my, my first fight was in 99. I was six. Yeah, he took us to a gym in Biter. It was called Twin Dragons. We were, and then we'd go home and train in the garage. How'd you go from that to becoming a, a pro fighter? I was struggling, the hours in the gym sweat. It just got, got a, sh my first MMA fight was November 30th, 2012. And my homeboy was supposed to fight. And he got hurt and then I took his, his fight in three days notice. More than 39 seconds, first round. And then I got my first check, March 16th, 2013. In 35 seconds. I was 19, and then uh, just that's what got me hooked. Your game is, is jujitsu, right? Yeah. And jujitsu is all about uh, submission holds and, and getting your opponent to tap out. Yeah, well, I fight, man. I put some in my arm bar that, that, that forget their will and they go to my will, which is I want them to quit. I want them to tap out. So they quit, you know. Uh, so basically, I've been submitting to the flesh. My flesh is like drugs. Most of it's just drugs, it's been my problem. But, if I just submit myself in to, to the spirit instead of the flesh, I know I'll catalyze. Tell me a little bit about your uh, your favorite fight. Uh, probably this last one for Legacy. I was on the main card for a big league. And I fought a, a pretty good, pretty tough dude. I'm him in 14 seconds. 14 seconds? I mean, you no, know, we went out there and touched gloves and he just shot his head to the side and I just threw my straight and he fell. I went from South Texas back to Vider to Houston. I went to San Antonio. Wow. Back to Vider. And then down here. What kind of stands in your way of reaching your goals of, of being a world champ? Uh, myself. That's the biggest one. A good friend of mine, my manager, Robert Tocqueville. I was uh, struggling pretty bad back home and, and gave me an opportunity to come out here and then uh, switch my stuff up. And, Take fight, you know, as a, as a job training. Cool. What does your training look like? You know, what do you do to try to get in shape for a fight? Uh, I'm supposed to run, but I don't run. Uh, I just hit the bag, mitts, sparring, and then sharpen all my technique, learning new moves, and just staying hungry. Staying hungry and having fun. That's the main thing. If you could share a message with other people who are struggling about you know, how to press on, how to get through, how to go from day to day, how to overcome these hurdles, what would it be? It doesn't matter if, if you feel like you don't deserve it or if people tell you you don't deserve it, but if God tells you you deserve it, you deserve it. And, uh, nobody can take that away from you. And God opened doors for you to walk through. And if some doors are there, God's put that in your path for you. you know? Prayer and being in the Word, and surrounding yourself with positive positive people and, and being in a good environment and uh, taking all the 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 easy to see negatives out of the way. I guess that's the best thing I could say. You know I wanna I was going to look up there and talk to you, Matt, but since you're back there, I'll talk to you this way. Um, this verse I read just a little bit ago, um, I, want to, I want to share it with you, and you probably have this memorized too, but it's just a good, it's a good one for all of us. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, come to me, Jesus says, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, you know, some of you have heard me talk about this before, but this is a great analogy for the relationship Jesus wants to have with you, Matt, and all of us. You know, like a yoke is used to connect oxen together, enabling them to work together, 
to pull heavy loads, to, to plow the ground. And, and there, usually a younger one is, is, is uh, uh, connected to an older, more experienced one, all right? So, so that you can learn from the other one. And that's the kind of relationship Jesus wants to have with us. That, that's what he says. He is wanting to help those of us who are tired, those of us who are burdened from trying to carry the load by yourself. He wants you to let him come alongside you. It's not about you going to him. It's about you letting him come to you because he has made that promise to be there for you, to be yoked to him, strengthened by him, and to learn from him, not to do things for him but to receive from him his love and his learning. Well, that's a young man who's got a big hurdle in his life he's trying to overcome, and we need to keep him in our prayers. There's another man who uh, faces a hurdle every day, every single day. And every day, he overcomes that hurdle. He never quits. You've heard me talk to him before. His name is Joel Gertis. He's a member of this congregation. He's never attended here because he's a quadriplegic. Had a bad accident. But I promised him when we did this interview that we were all going to do a shout-out to Joel. So if you'd all just look up at this camera up here, say, hey, Joel. Hey, Joel. Joel. All right, he's going to love that. He's going to love that. And... um, I don't need to say much more about him. Just take a look at this interview. Well, I'd like to introduce you all to uh, Joel Gertis, a member of Good Shepherd for a lot of years, Joel. Um, how long have you been connected to Good Shepherd? I believe I moved here in 2006, and that's when I was first contacted by Good Shepherd. You pretty much attend church every week, don't you? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm kind of sitting here in the house, but I watched as soon as you all started the video. Well, that's how you attend, though. That's how I attend, yeah. Yeah. I get a kick out of it every Sunday I like to watch, yeah. Gary's been coming over here and giving me communion. Leroy uh, did it before that. Hey, Leroy, how you doing, bud? Our theme is overcoming hurdles, and you have quite a hurdle that you have overcome and are overcoming every day of your life. Tell us what happened. In July 97, I went to the Comal River with a bunch of buddies of mine. We stopped at a place in the river where there was an eddy and dove in. There was stuff under the water this time, big rocks mm-hmm. that I didn't see. So I dove into the rocks and then and broke my neck. They flew me to, to the local hospital there in, uh, in Green or New Braunfels. Mm-hmm. Flew me to Brack and immediately stretched me out, shaved my head, put a halo around my, mm-hmm. my head and stretched me out and then got ready to do surgery in a few days. And so that's how I became a C5-6. So I guess I'm called an incomplete quadriplegic. When I first got hurt, I mean, pretty much across my chest line, mm-hmm. everything did not work. Obviously, this hand doesn't do much. This one I can hold. Well, I can run that computer with this finger mm-hmm. and um, hold it, hold, uh, you know, do all the things I need to do to eat. I do live alone. I got my dog. Yeah, <laughs> got my company. <laughs> I cut my own grass, put my mower around my front and backyard. And every once in a while, I fall and I can't get up. So I do have to call the fire department, which I got to say, these guys at the fire department here in uh, Leander are the best guys that I've ever met. Yeah, it's a great town, great community. I've lived a lot of things and done a lot of crazy stuff, extreme sports stuff, motocross, bungee jumping, stuff like that. I had regular wheelchairs that I put fatter tires on, go-kart tires, motorcycle rear tires, like the one I got in there, because these white tires run out and make you buy them every six months. When I dove in, and I was laying there on my back, and a bunch of people were standing around me saying, don't move, don't move, we're going to fly you somewhere. I was like, oh boy, this is a new chapter. Hey mom, I uh, just broke my neck. Things are going to change, so I better tell dad, and we better figure out what's going to happen, because this is not good, you know. And that was about that was a, that was was about the low part, the low point. She didn't blame God, you just said it's a new oh, chapter. No, I, no, God, it was my fault, I'm jumped into the water. So your faith just was not shook at all? No. Not shook at all? No. No. I never questioned God. Why you do this to me? It was just like, what are we going to do now? All right, well, here's the plan. It's the same faith I've had since I was a kid. Everything it was always taken care of, and it was always God that took care of it. I'm like the, the last person you want to, to tell you how to, how, to, how to live your life and be a good Christian. And I've still got a lot of good friends that I've had all growing up through my life. And we always seem to come back to our faith. And even if maybe they didn't have the faith or didn't grow up with a preacher for a dad or 
in the church or anything. Maybe my, I wasn't the great example, but maybe I was a little bit of an example. And maybe over the years, it's kind of rubbed off. Of, it's almost like we take it for granted, you know, when we're five years old and we know Jesus or however old we are when our parents first tell us, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know. I used to get this old uh, Our Daily Bread thing, put it in the computer, it's Our Daily Bread, and I've been reading those devotions forever. First thing I do when I turn my computer on. What would you say, as you look out at your congregation, and I know you can't see them right now, but um, what would you what would you say to encourage uh, the people who are struggling? Wow. Um, all, I can, all I can say is um, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries for itself. Yes. God takes care of the flowers and the birds. Certainly he's gonna take care of me. I mean, I know it's in there, and maybe that's what I, why I never got depressed after I got hurt either. I just knew, okay, I know how this works. This isn't gonna, this isn't gonna knock me down. Life is good, and, and even if I'm in a wheelchair, everything's fine. There's a, a great section of Scripture in Romans chapter 8. That I want to read just a, a few of these verses here. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And then he goes on to say, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Isn't that, isn't that what you just heard? Through him we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither drugs or addiction or depression or physical limitations or deformations or paralysis or mental illness or deficiency, having a brain that's wired differently so you're not normal, maybe about how you look and how you think and your personality as everybody else's. Not even a sin that's still haunting you. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I know I paraphrase a little bit there, but that's really what that says because that's what it means. So I want to thank you, Matt. I want to thank you, Joel. I want to thank all of you who have hurdles in your life, and you know you do, and you've overcome them or you're working at it. For the rest of us, I want to say thank you, Jesus, because he overcame the hurdle we all needed to have overcome. And he's there to encourage us to do just that. So the next time you hit a hurdle in this life and you fall, get back up because you got a race to run and run to the finish amen